more concerning in the in the power play, you know, um, separate from its lack of putting it in the net, is that when it does score, it can make for an easy night. They're not getting easy. They're not getting any easy nights. It's no. every game. Every game now is tied. Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast, powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Network. Uh, I think this is the uh, 80th uh, episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joe Haggerty. You can find my work at joehaggerty.substack.com. Uh, just sign up for a premium membership. You get all of my NHL and Bruins writings sent straight directly to your inbox. I also file columns after every game. For the Boston Sports Journal, go to bostonsportsjournal.com and get the breakdowns after every Bruins game with me today. Uh, I want to thank Mick Collagio and Kevin Paul DuPont, longtime friends and colleagues, for joining me. Uh, Kevin Paul DuPont from the Boston Globe, of course, longtime hockey writer. Uh, and Mick, please tell everybody where they can find your work. I like you to plug your own stuff. Okay, bostonhockeynow.com. I have a Sunday column. Um, I appear in uh, big issues of the hockey news on the Bruins section on those uh, season previews, prospect previews, blah, blah, blah. And uh, let's see what else uh, I get my, I get my blog, my blog on game nights, uh, rank wrap. There you go. I uh, check all that stuff out uh, for Mick and dupes. Um, let's also thank our sponsors, prize picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks, you simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. Uh, for example, David Pasternak, you can pick shots, goals, uh, Charlie McAvoy, you can even pick block shots, hits, things like that. Uh, so it's really, uh, an interesting, sort of thing to use to make the games interesting march is over but the biggest moments in college basketball uh tip off the month of april be a part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball uh you get in on the playoff action win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball's postseason uh download the prize picks app today and use the code clns for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's download the prize picks app, uh, which is super easy to download and use. I've done it myself. And use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Okay. As we record this episode, uh, it's before the Carolina game, after the Nashville game. Uh, really great defensive effort uh, against Nashville. Um, Allmark was obviously solid. Um, but among the 31 saves, I wouldn't, you know, I, I think a few were really good, but most, most of them were textbook positional saves, good defense in front of them. Um, just what, uh, dupes did you make out of that Nashville game? Uh, anything significant in your mind, uh, after a game like that, where a few days before we were at Bruins practice and, uh, Montgomery was dropping F-bombs on the ice at practice saying, uh, other teams were going to pump in six effing goals against us if, uh, we play the way we do in some of these drills, uh, you know, the, the transition defense, the, the, not, the not paying attention to detail. And then all of a sudden they go out and they put together a really strong beginning to end. I thought defensive effort with no odd man rushes uh, against a pretty good Nashville team. He's play, he's trying to play dark Monty. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. And, and it started about four or five weeks ago, pregame in Toronto where his whole demeanor had changed. So it's a recognition that he's got to be a, a different kind of he's he's got to convey a different message to get their attention whether whether it's happening or not I don't know certainly not happening on the power play no uh, we were on the road the other day I can't even remember where we were we were in Washington and they had they had the first unit out there it was it was it was a brief day of game skate and he's over on the sideboards and the next thing you hear this is how practice ends. I've seen enough of that bleep and power play. Time to stretch it out, boys. So <laughs> uh it's now one for 13, I think, over the last five games. Yep. Uh I have to say, first of all, great to be with you guys as always. Secondly, uh, I'm amazed that we didn't start with the discussion of the line brawl last night in New York. Oh, where, I love that. I mean, I you, we can you, definitely in, talk in, about that. In the betting app application business. I did have <laughs> Curtis, L Curtis Lazar and Jimmy Vesey starting the whole thing. <laughs> Yow. Well, 
when you get almost everybody that's on the ice ejected uh, two seconds into the game, I mean, that is beautiful. That's beautiful old time hockey as far as yeah. I'm concerned. I don't think we see that stuff enough. And I know there are a lot of people out there that you know want to veer away from that and are all about the beauty and skill and speed of the game and all that stuff. And that's all great. It's all got its place. But I think you still in the NHL need to be able every once in a while, if you have two teams that hate each other, just go out there and start a fight to start the game like that. I have zero problem with that whatsoever. Well, anyway, we'll we'll steer over there when you, whenever you want to steer over there. But uh, back back to Bruins. Um, you know, the national game. I, I will I will give the Bruins a lot of credit for you know zero zero after forty. I think that's the fourth time this year. They've gone six games in a row now, I think, where they haven't had a lead at the 40-minute mark. And, of course, that's always a, a pretty good indicator of how a team's playing. Uh, you know, that that's a that's an excellent team they played. And yep. and to match them for, for the 40 even and then, you know, then rifle in three and win it, uh, that, that's a good game for them. All Mark strong. Um, it, I'm still not, and this is the cliche of cliches, but it always proves true, I'm still not seeing the best hockey from their best players and that, that, that could be a real issue. Yeah. And, and that dupes plays into the power play for sure. Um, and I, I think when you watch Brad Marchand right now, he looks like a 35 year old Brad Marchand that is right. also on the precipice of, you know, a big milestone goal and is maybe pressing a little bit and forcing things. Certainly looks like he's forcing things on the power play at times. Uh, and looks like he's going outside of his game at times, and maybe even conserving a little bit for the postseason too, sort of trying to keep the tank uh, full now because he knows the important games are coming up. But we have not seen his best since the uh, All-Star break, I would say, um, from Brad Martian, except for maybe a couple of games. Like, he was definitely impact player in that Florida game where they wanted to make a statement. I thought that was one of his best games since the All-Star break. So he's had one or two of those where he ratcheted up, I, I thought, um, when he needed to or when he wanted to. But, uh, Mick, I, I've seen the same thing with the power play. They're struggling mightily. Their best players are not getting it done. Uh, I think Brad Marchand has, has you know, really tried to force things at times, and some of the other players have too. And it continues to highlight one other thing that I've seen, which is that, you know, I, I'm not sure Charlie McAvoy is the number one power play, you know, defenseman at the point either. Uh, with the 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 reluctance to shoot and the uh, the wanting to pass and set up his teammates instead of you know shooting the puck and being a viable scoring threat at times there. But um, what do you make of that game against Nashville and and also maybe uh, some of the power play things that uh, Dupes mentioned? Well, by contrast, uh, the New York Rangers winning goal late in the third, and you can say whatever you want about the ticky tackness of Brendan Smith's hook. Uh, but that was Park Middleton stuff. Uh, Adam Fox weaving to his right, shooting to his left, keeping the puck on the ice and putting it right to an arriving Chris Kreider so he could just put a stick right in the right spot at the right moment and put that thing right over the shoulder, um, and the game's over. And in, in just one perfect execution – to me, it really highlighted for me how much the Bruins power play is just so pedestrian. And uh, because even though you have some brilliant talent on the ice, uh, Pasternak seems to want to invent the game every time he goes out there. That's a great quality in his game. It's something that's allowed him to continue to expand his offensive portfolio continue to remain uh, a, a great offensive force when he's not playing with uh, generationally great centermen. And, and here he is uh, still, I think he's having a better season than he did last year because yeah. so much of the defense funnels toward him and, and says, don't let this guy beat us like a basketball game. And, and instead. Well, and so he's not playing with Krejci or Bergeron either. You know, he's going to do so much I mean. more on his own. Right. So, so, so he asked, but, but I think when he tries to bring that, that intuitive, creative, instinctive stuff to the power play, I think it's difficult for the team to act as a unit. And I think maybe he needs to dial back how much he tries to uh, imagine in the moment 
and and just do things that are more set plays. That thing the Rangers did last night was a set play. Uh, it was something to practice. Uh, you know, uh, Marshan, you're right. He's still doing stuff you expect to see in October, November, where where he's uh, taking his notes and making guys look good against him. And he's not at that point where he usually is in the season where he's suddenly torching all those people. Uh, that's not happening. So, yeah, there's issues there. And, you, you know, and, and let's, you know, we know that McAvoy was not a BU uh, power play guy at BU. Um, so bringing up him to the power play in the NHL and growing that part of his game on the job when it wasn't his game at BU uh, at that point in his life uh, is going to have flat points and th places where it's not going to grow. Uh, so, yeah, it's not a Tory Krug type point man uh, who can be great from a still position. Uh, he's a guy who's at his best when he's really moving. Uh, so, yeah, th there's issues there. And I'm not really sure what the answer is with this group, uh, but a power plays tend not to worry me. And the biggest of pictures, the New Jersey Devils were 30th out of 30 in 2003 and won the Stanley Cup. Well, so, how about the Bruins in 2011 when they won? Their power yeah, play exactly. was, was power terrible, play too. Wasn't great. Not a right. great power play in the regular season, but then they threw in a double elbow on the left with uh, with a rotation. It was with Bergeron and Krejci kind of moving in and out. You know, one guy's down the corner, one guy's in the you – know, so they had more structure as they moved. And I liked – that there was more uh, thought behind how they did it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing them, you know, those guys go into a think tank and maybe give them a new power play just to get their minds out of their own, off their old doldrums. And it wouldn't have hurt to have a, a tougher, stronger pros, a presence in front of the net. Um, you know, Brazo, I don't know what his situation is uh, with yeah. his little injury, but uh, I wouldn't mind seeing him or Maroon when he's ready be that guy right in front of Lynette. Yeah, I think Brazo would be a guy I would like to see there just based on the offensive skill set he has. And I think he yeah. could handle that kind of a role with higher level offensive players, um, you know, making plays around him as long as he's not too deferential to everybody else uh, if you got into a situation like that. But I think he's built for net front of the power play as he's shown uh, with the second unit. One interesting thing, uh, you know, Dupes mentioned – um that you know that was the what the fourth time you said dupes that they've gone zero zero going into the third period right. um i i would say most of those other games and a lot of the other times when it's been low scoring this year i've felt like swayman or Allmark has had to stand on their head at some point in a period or a long stretch to get to that point to get to a zero zero and you know maybe it's a slow start and they make 12 saves in the first period whatever that game against nashville was one where i thought the Elmark did not have to stand on his head really at all. Like he made some good saves, but I thought that was just technically sound 200 foot, good attention to detail, good defensive hockey, which is not something we've seen typically from this group this year. And the fact that we're seeing that late in the season against a pretty good team, I take as, as an encouraging sign. Prize picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. Um, but you know, to, to mix point, um, you know, with Brazil getting injured, I think that throws some things into, it's funny how that player has become somebody that I think is important to them, uh, come playoff time with what he's done. And if that's a significant injury, that is going to be impact them, uh, quite a bit, uh, given where he was trending as far as the roles he was going to play. You no, know, we haven't seen a lot of him, but he was encouraging in that. And he is the big body. And, you know, the, the other part of this discussion is hand in hand with 
you know, JVR hasn't hasn't been the guy. Not lately. Nope. And, and uh and you know he's turning into a healthy scratch and Brazo, good for him. He's taking he's taking advantage of the opportunity or has. He did he, that that looked like he could be out for a while the other night, but yep. we'll find out more about that. Uh what 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 I find more that more concerning in the in the power play you know um separate from its lack of putting it in the net is that what when it does score it can make for an easy night they're not getting easy they're not getting any easy nights it's no. every game every game now is taught taught e even though even though they've got a they've got a playoff berth we don't know which one it is mm -hmm. they are in the top three or four in terms of points percentage in the league uh, they're probably going to win the division, so yep. we can we can come up with all these foibles. Nonetheless, they've survived, and really much of much of why they are where they are today is because they went nine and one in the first ten. They've been a very pedestrian team over the last sixty five games. Yep, uh, pedestrian being pretty much fourteen one and three. Yeah. yeah, that's the one where remember when Montgomery right. had, you know, was talking about I don't know if we're a 14 1 and 3 team or whatever it was, like right. right around that that start, like right at that moment, they were kind of like we're playing over our heads and we sort of know it. And you're right, that start catapulted them into where they are now because, like, you know, Wiley Coyote had run off it, the cliff and didn't look down yet. <laughs> well, not to mention if the scoring system was different and you didn't get, you know, points for overtime shootout losses and you know and things like that there would also be a, they'd be a much different team as well right. um I, you know, I don't like those path hypotheticals though because they played the games knowing what the rules were you yep. know so but yeah. but the point being they're not winning as many regulation games as a lot of the other teams are around them which i think they haven't it, all year that's right, right. which is which oh, is and, an and, issue and something to to you know for and to my, my my main point here the the mental mental physical fatigue yeah uh that they've been under here and and some of it really isn't necessary uh they've got the playoff berth i think maybe at some point they've got to look at that but you know i had this discussion with marshand in washington where i was asking about would you consider a game off and it's it just doesn't it doesn't play to his ear at all no and montgomery montgomery back to back to dark monty he's not going <laughs> to be the guy who has him sit out he isn't. But right. right now, I'd say, based on his play, age, mileage, where they are and everything, I would sit him out. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to say I'd sit him out for a week, but over the final, I didn't do that. What is it? Seven games to go? Six games, guys? Whatever. Yeah. The, these final handful of games, I'd give him a couple of blows here. I certainly would, especially coming off last year where Bergeron tweaked his back in that last game that he yeah. played. Right. I, I, I would hope you've learned your lesson as far as holding those guys out at the very end and giving them a little extra rest to make sure they've got everything they need and they're fully healthy going into the playoffs. Because, you know, what we saw last year was, uh, you know, Allmark, Lindholm, Bergeron, there was a bunch of players that got banged up right at the very end when they were playing. Maybe some of that's, you know, you can't avoid. It's just, you know, uh, fate and bad luck, but some of it I think is also being smart about usage and the way that you're playing them, especially with an older crew, uh, where so many of those guys are key and where, like to your point, dupes, I think part of the struggle that we've seen from Brad Marchand is that he's 35 years old and he's played a lot of heavy minutes this year. And that is one thing about Jim Montgomery is he has like put a lot on his best players as far as playing time, as far as ice time, as far as you know, uh, really Which riding a league, hard. League trend in a flat cap era. A yeah. lot of forwards are skating defenseman type minutes. But you noticed it league. like in, in January, February, Mick, where they yeah. were really like, you know, Pasternak was playing 23 minutes right. fairly regularly. You know, Martian was over 20. Like he was really riding the horses hard when mm -hmm. they'd already seemingly, you know, had a playoff spot sewn up based on that great start. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and I think it's, if you look at the top forwards across the league, I think that the answer of the NHL was, okay, you guys insist on making this much money and we're in a flat yeah. cap situation. And this is what we're forced to sign seven guys to, to, uh, you know, $780,000 two-way contracts. Then yep. we're going to uh, skate you into the ground. 
you know, and, and uh, that's going to be it. You want, you know, so, uh, and they always complain about not having to practice time anyway. So uh, they probably feel like, Hey, what's the big deal? As long as we're healthy, guys want to play, give them the, give them the puck, you know? So uh, I think that's been the trend of the league, but we're also finding out now that 82 games is a, a long slog. And everybody, how many comments have we heard in the last two weeks of, oh boy, I wish the playoffs could start right now. You know, yeah. it's not just because their team's doing good. They're just sort of done with the season and ready to get on with it. Right. So right. Yeah, the other part of the, the and it's a, a great point you make, Mick, about the flat cap era. If you, But if you look at the construct of this team, you know, hand in hand with the flat cap is, okay, they had, they had holes. They went out and got these million dollar a year rentals, Lucic being one of them. Uh, yep. you know, AVR, the whole list. Shattenkirk. But, yeah. But what, what carries you through from the flat cap era or even, even before the cap is the young kids come up and take jobs. And we haven't seen enough of that again, right? Just haven't seen it. Uh, Lori comes in, he, 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 you know, there's, there's some, there's, there's, there's a lot to like about him. It's not like he's come up and demanded the job and seized it. So right. you got to get and more. Potter to- got injured. So right, Potter uh, comes in. And he gets, for him. You know, and predictable, I might add, right? You know, young yes. kid, small, still yep. not got the weight on him, all of that, the stuff we talked about. So it, it, you know, what what carries you through here in the it, more than anything is bringing these kids up. And when you've when you've given away or negotiated away a lot of picks, this is what you get. I will say, Rather than sort of the young kids that they've drafted and developed that have done that, though, they have found some players that are in that next tier of sort of like other players and other organizations that are in their mid 20s that are on low contract yes. that have come in and done jobs. Brazo, Anthony Richard was excellent when he came up. I thought yep. Fluto had a good story yesterday on him, basically illustrating that, you know, part of the reason he was sent down is because he was going to be uh, have to be put on waivers to get sent back down if he'd stayed up with them when he was really effective. And I think there was a fear of losing him before, you know, the postseason. And he, you know, he may be in the mix come playoff time. And I think, frankly think he should the way he played. I thought he was excellent uh, in a fourth line role, bottom six role when he was up here before. And I would expect to see him at some point in the playoffs based on uh, the way that he played once the salary cap is gone and waivers are gone and all that, and they can just bring him up. Um, uh, Ballquist Parker- has been really good. I, I, yeah, you know, the Ballquist, of the year, Parker, Weatherspoon, all these guys. Yeah, Weatherspoon was a was a genius pickup. A guy buried in the Islanders system because they had a uh, they were loaded on D three years ago, and and he was stuck down there. But he was playing under a great coach, Brent Thompson, and uh, and honing his skills the way Islanders defensemen do. And so that's what the Bruins got. He was plug and play from the moment he got here. So. Uh, but Boquist has been a, a real uh, revelation to me with the speed and, and the fact that that little body of his, he throws it around with effect. He's effective that way. Um, and then the other guy that um, that I w- that was on my brain when you guys were talking, and now the name's flitting away from me here. So all of a sudden, I'm gonna just in the middle of your conversation, I'm gonna scream out a name at some point here. Uh, well, a, a name we should a name we should bring Hanton up. Anton Heinen. Anton Heinen. Yes. Yeah. Han- yeah. Yes. And what an incredible and to give story credit- he's been. Yep. And I think I think Beecher is has has moved into that role that I'm talking about. Yeah, there's that, yep. I'm seeing a lot of promise now in Beecher. Yep. Those that, you know, that's what you want. You want your 19, 20, 22 year olds to come in and really take jobs. Mm. Yeah. It's been a mixture. It's been a mixture of of the significant contributions from from the hodgepodge that was signed. Um, and Heinen waiting for the cap situation to straighten itself out yeah. so that they could sign him and the patience that both sides showed through that process and how good a player he's been for them for most of the season. He's been one of their better wingers. So, uh, you know, yep. I know the thing of that. And then we see guys that, you know, uh, that have emerged, you know, Merkeloff was so high on my list. He had one visit here. He played in on a fourth line situation. It was a short visit. It didn't go well. And, uh, you know, it just was completely didn't work out the way I was looking forward to. Uh, yep. It was completely off the rails wrong about that situation for this season. And uh, but now uh, uh, the, and the guy everybody talks about on the offseason, the most is Lysel. And while he's actually had a good year, but is now hurt. Right. Uh, 
uh, he um, he was he's a guy who hasn't been here at all. So, uh, you know, and probably would have. I still think we would have seen him by now, given the season he had been having. If he before. didn't get hurt, I think we would have seen him towards the end here. If they were spelling veterans or sitting guys, I definitely think he would have gotten at least a game just based on. Right the season that he had in Providence and how he sort of listened to the criticism and sort of turned things around. He definitely was going to get one based on all that. Uh, if he hadn't gotten injured, uh, Danton Heinen, uh, he's going to be a top six forward going into the playoffs in that lineup. I mean, and that is a testament to the, the, the season that he's had and what he's been able to do after having a sing for his supper in, in training camp for a contract. Um, and being another one of those guys, uh, you know, the five, six, seven guys that are making 775 K, um, on this team, uh, because of the salary cap and the situation that they were in. So I, I, and I think he's also put himself in a position where the Bruins would be, you know, well, uh, well suited to go out and extend him and bring him back for another year or two, if the money's right. Um, and it's, you know, a million bucks, 1.5, something like that for a year or two based on the versatility, based on the way he's played this year, based on that he's still, at the end of the day, a drafted and developed Bruins player as well, uh, you know, that the Don Sweeney and all those guys had a hand in, you know, developing, and I think that's meaningful to them to to keep those guys around if they can. So I, and he has you know, said he played for Monty in college. So. Right. I, I think he's done enough that he's going to be back based on everything uh, above, but, like, you know, he deserves plenty of credit for the season that he's put on and, and where he's come from and where he's going. That's logical. But if they think that they're going to get a hand of Ben on UFA, uh, there's no extension yet. Is there? Um, so, so, no. but if they think that, then they might tell guys like Hein and Hey, look, we got to take care of some other business. So yep. if you can hang in there with us and, you know, July 15th, by then he, I think he's going to have a better contract with somebody else. If what would you give if you're the goal. Bruins? If you're, if you're the Bruins this afternoon, what do you give uh, Hanton, Heinen on a three-year deal? I'm not sure. I do. I as much as I like his contribution, and, and he might get my seventh player vote. Uh, I, I feel more like um, I'm kind of like saying, "Hey, I got to figure. I got to know what's what the bigger fish, what the big fish situations are." before I make any commitments toward guys like him, I'm not going to placeholder him. I don't think he should sign for a placeholder kind of situation. I feel like he should get an honest uh, deal here. He's earned it. And I think that he'll get it. He, I just don't think it's lined up right for him to get it here. I think he's going to wind up somewhere else. I wouldn't go three years with him. I'd go a couple of years, maybe two years, like $4 million total, something like that. And in that range, like, and, and bank it on the fact that a guy like that, that went through the experience of having to go to the tryout route is, you know, gonna want a guaranteed deal somewhere, a yep. deal. And a, there may be some loyalty there based on them bringing him in when, you know, other teams weren't. And nobody would give him a guaranteed contract where, you know, maybe he feels something towards them to stick around for that kind of money. I wouldn't go overboard with him. You know, I I think his value is in his versatility and, you know, essentially being a third or a fourth line guy that can also play uh, top six if you need him to right now. But like, you know, I, I think the season he's having right now, what, 15 goals, 32 points, 33 points. I think that's the max like offense you're going to see out of that guy. So you're not going to, you know, un unload much more money or term than that um, to to bring them in. What do you think, Dupes? I see all your points. I, I I'd sign him for three years, eight million right now. Yep. Um, you know, given his given his contribution this year, given his age, still young. Yep. Uh, given that the cap's going up two point what what have I done? Two point seven million there. Yeah, about yep. two point seven million, two point six six. Um. That, that that that'd be a very comfortable signing for me and my guess is he'd probably take it G yeah. given g given as you say joe he had a you, might, for you might be right that's very reasonable sounding and and if i'm dying and i might you know my eyeballs might turn into dollar signs at that right. moment you know right so. so all all that all that at play and then i think of guys that they lost uh come you know would come to mind a different type of player at all achari right yeah Char got to the point and i i love the chari here he hasn't been he got hurt and there's a whole the whole history there but for who he was i would have given a chari that kind of money at the time they they didn't do that 
Well, their 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 mo throughout that era has been had been to uh, let the as soon as your fourth liners who are making a million or whatever uh, right. were were strong enough UFAs in their mid twenties to get two million, two and a half million from some team that wasn't as good as the Bruins who were pounding out fifty wins every year. Um, right. That they had to let those guys go. Tim Schaller, you know, perfect example. So yeah. Yeah, 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 I agree. Let Schaller go, but I think I think Pirelli. they missed. I think they missed the boat on Achari. It doesn't change the course of the franchise, but that would have been a comfortable signing for me, just yep. as Heinen would be. And he's yep. one of those guys you say, "Boy, I wish we had him right now." You know, yep. a lot of times when they needed uh, certain things in their lineup, they weren't getting um, his career. Well, especially had, you know, when issues, but... he went to Florida, I think he had a twenty goal season when he went down there uh, after he left Boston. You know, I think he had he yeah. He, had some very a strong year or two before to yeah. Deuce's point the injuries started uh at play with him which was going to happen given his size and the way he plays injuries were definitely going to become a factor yeah. uh for him sooner rather than later and maybe that's part of the reason the Bruins you and know, he was victimized on a bad hit he yes took a, he took a bad hit coming up the wing um a guy missed one to hit knew he was going to miss the hit and found a way to get him anyway and it was that illegal way to get you suspended so Yep. Yeah, so he's paid, um, you know, some of it's luck. Mick, do you have any thoughts on that line brawl last night? Let's get back to that because Dupes uh, <laughs> it had that on his mind. And like, it's I, the look, red meat hour. It's well, the well, red meat hour. Dupes, this is the Rempe uh, in, uh, effect. You know, this is what yeah. that guy brings to the table. Yeah. And I love it. Like, he, well, the, the, this whole thing happened, I think, right? Right. Because of what he did to New Jersey, yes. uh, you know, when he first came up and uh, he turned down a fight. He turned out he, yes well after he was running around hurting people and like you know throwing and throwing crazy hits and doing what he was doing um but i love it i i, I don't <laughs> we don't see enough of this and i thoroughly enjoyed it and i think hardcore diehard hockey fans enjoyed that and i still think we see, need to see that in at least a game or two uh a year um mick i don't know how you feel about it we haven't seen it since that dallas game in boston right <laughs> what was that <laughs> like, around here 15, no 15 years ago the yeah. Bruins and the Stars dropped the puck and everybody on the ice fought yep. just immediately. I remember how feeling that caught me off guard so much when that happened. And uh, how long is McDermott? Didn't the Devils acquire McDermott for this express purpose? I mean, wasn't this a situation where they knew they needed a certain kind of player on their team and they went out and got this guy? Transactions, March yeah. 1st, 2024, traded by the Avalanche. To the Devils for seventh round pick in 24 and uh, Jakar Bartikov, who I have no idea who that is. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so the Devils acquired him at this deadline <laughs> for that, yeah. for last night's game. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. The only reason you're going to acquire a guy like McDermott is for that express purpose. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's why you're bringing in a guy like that. It's been a great year for guys like him and Ryan Reeves to have Rempe around to make them more relevant. Because those guys are dinosaurs otherwise. And when they fight each other, it's 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 really looked upon in a tired act. But now you got this new kid on the block. You know, you got Rocky here, who's six foot seven or whatever he is, and he's and he's he's pretty pretty big boy. And he and now, you know, when uh he's going out and he's fighting. Hey, earlier this season, before his recall from the Wolf Pack, the Providence Bruins had re acquired. Uh, Victor uh, Arsenault from Abbotsford, which is Vancouver's farm team, was playing on an AHL contract for the Pete Bruins, and Arsenault knocked him down with a right hand. Uh, you know, so so uh, you know this guy was doing this all year in the AHL, and he he takes as much as he gives. Yeah, and uh, and you know, so I, boy, you know, I mean, right now, I mean, the Rangers know they needed more of this. I think their whole decision to go get Peter Laviolette to coach them this year was to make them play with a little more of this personality. And I think there would have been deadline moves for them to go get Curtis McDermott or, or they would have been competitive in a situation like that, or to add more of the thump to their team, uh, similar to the early nineties Rangers and the moves they made, giving up guys like Tony Amonti and Mike Gartner in order to get guys like Asa Tikkanen and, and uh, you know whoever else that you know changed the look of their team and the feel of it and, and made it more playoff ready and uh, and and in, in this case uh, 
uh, Rempe, they feel like he's an internal solution to give them that uh, that edge. And they're trying to get it from underneath. They're trying to have a symbolic presence, make everybody feel tougher and play harder and feel more confident when it gets nasty. Uh, and they don't want to go out with a whimper like they did last year at the end of the first round. And they got essentially the same hockey team otherwise. But um, but they're they're now, you know, I still think that uh, the whole Lazar VC leading this thing off, uh, I think that might have been Travis Green's uh, genius at work there uh, because of the rule that any subsequent fights knock the rest of the team out of the game. And, and the Rangers wind up losing Truba in Keandre. You know, I mean, they lose, they lose a, you know, a, a top four defense pairing out of this, uh, you know, which, which is a rough and tumble couple of guys that suddenly got really open looking benches out there. And, you know, and there was a pretty good screaming match between Lavi and green uh, in the wake of this uh, event. So yeah, it was a hell of a way to start off a hockey game. I'm glad I decided to watch. I, I tell you watching it dupes, it makes you uh, wish uh, that the, and I'm sure Don Sweeney, Cam Neely watching it uh, wish or, or, uh, you know, work or think about like how they can, find a uh, rempe out there a young guy like that that can be a catalyst that can come in and and bring that kind of energy bring that kind of you know fight and and, and sort of bring that attitude uh to the team like he has with the rangers where he's clearly injected some life and in a different sort of vibe into that team um that's something i think the bruins could use frankly well sure and that's why they went out and got lucic right they got him as, yep. as, as high if, if that was important I, you know, I've, <laughs> I've had a million of these discussions over the years and, and, you know, the 1960s, 70s, 80s, me loved it. Uh, and, 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 and when I see it, the 60s, 70s and 80s, me comes out. <laughs> right. Because right. if you go back that, that whole thing lasted about 60 seconds. If you go yep. back at 107, at, at least in terms of watching a video, that's the end of it. And Rempe and the other guy just sort of walk away from each other. Yep. Uh, so it's it's 60 seconds. But the 90s, aughts, 10s, and 20s me has realized what the league realizes is by and large, you, you can't sell the game based on this. And that's what they were doing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. There was a lot of sales generated around fighting and, and vicious and bloodbaths and all that. That's been stripped out. Um, but what's what's catching up here, as we all know, is is the CTE and the lawyers and the scientists just are, are going to at some point take this entirely out of the game. So it's kind of this interesting museum piece when we see it now, and it does kind of get those juices going. But I I don't see it. What what it mm -hmm. underscores to me, separate from the fighting, is what you've touched on here, which is rivalry. This is this this is this is defining that rivalry and we don't get enough of them in the, yep. in the original 32. We had them when it was Boston, Quebec, when it was Boston, Buffalo, even Philly, you know, when you had to get, you had to be in the stands for warmups because the line brawl might start during the warm. Right? <laughs> well, you know, playing Montreal be... three times a year, isn't going to cut it. No, no, exactly. So there's not enough, uh, emphasis on the divisional aspect of this the fact that N new jersey knocked them out last year the fact that the rangers won the first two games had had uh, you know along the way injured two guys knocked them right out of the lineup in new jersey yep. there's all that kind of feeding off of prior games that we don't get anymore and and i i you know Separate from the fighting issue, I wish they would look at the rivalry aspect of this. There would be more, certainly more contact. There'd be more yak yak between the coaches on the bench, which you know that's another part of the theater that was fun. Right. Uh, but uh, overall, we don't get enough of the rivalry. They quant, they're hyper, con they're control freaks, and they think that they got this under the veneer. It's under the veneer of, of, of game management and game control now. The fact that you have automatic game misconducts for the subsequent four fights yeah. in that in that instance, uh, the fact that they, that they don't want these scenarios that get the game out of the referees, out of the league's control, but somehow they are perpetuating the CTE situation because stage fights are still allowed. 
for the most part, if you're watching any hockey game this year, two guys get mad in the middle of a of a puck battle and start going at each other and drop the gloves and want to fight. They don't want them to fight. They don't like them to fight. They start right. breaking them up. The linesmen don't want hockey fights. Yep. Uh, they certainly don't want them right after a whistle in front of the net. They don't want hockey fights. But if two guys decide that they're all pros and they want to, they got a score to settle and they're gonna, you know, do this thing. You can't remove the helmets anymore. That's a penalty. Uh, I remember those videos where you see guys remove each other's helmets so that right. they could have their fight. Uh, well, it was funny. Uh, Reeves fought um, Tanner Janot last night, too, and it looked like Reeves was starting to go for the helmet, like he was going to take his off if Janot was going to take his off because Janot had a visor, but he ended up keeping his on, and they had, he ended up knocking it off anyway um, yeah. once they started throwing punches. But I think he was, you know, that that instinct of, like, to take off the helmets is still there for the old school guys. Right. So I think right now the – the fighters, the combatants, they're embracing the a greater relevance uh, right now that's being celebrated around the league because it 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 lends itself in the best instance of its of how it helps the game is like situations like last night where everybody wound up fighting, uh, you know. And so, uh, but I think that in the long haul, uh, the the stage fights, the sideshows have to go. Those are the ones who wind up with the brains at BU. I think that the I think that the hockey fights. I, I wish that the league would loosen their their control, their death grip on on hockey fights and let anger fights happen because th those that's the one that's in the book. You can fight either or that or just take it or just take the damn thing out. If you're well, not going to let an organic hockey fight happen, then end the era. Yeah, I, I agree, and and. There are points like, and we've seen this over the last few years when the linesmen step in prematurely or they step in to try to head it off at the pass where either there's a, a risk of a player getting hurt, either punched when the you know linesman's holding his arms down or trying to like hold him back or the linesman getting clocked by somebody as they're trying to throw punches at each other because they're trying to step in uh, between two guys that want to go. And I, I think definitely think there needs to be a line there where you know, if two guys want to start throwing punches, they need to get out of the way and just let them take care of business and then, you know, break it up afterwards instead of trying to, as you're saying, manage the game to make sure there's no fights. Like, you know, not legislate it out, but, you know, tell your linesman to break up anything before it starts or, or whatever the, it is that they're doing. We do have Factor Meals uh, to help us out. America's number one ready to eat meal kit when it does get busy, when it does get crazy, when we do need a, a quick meal. Uh, they fuel you up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. Takes less than two minutes to cook them. They're fresh, never frozen. Meals ready in two minutes, like I said. Uh, they have calorie conscious options going upscale with some of the things they're offering now, like surf and turf, surf and surf meal options, roasted garlic filet mignon and shrimp and Cajun spiced shrimp and salmon, which is like right in my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff I'm all about. So it's got everything for everybody. Uh, there's 34 plus chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options for meals. Uh, you can get snacks, you can get breakfast items. Like it's, it's, it's a great deal. Um, so if you want to get Factor Meals, uh, go to factormeals.com slash hags50 and use the code hags50 to get 50% off of your fir first box. It's a great deal. Uh, you know, I, I've tried it. It's fantastic. I recommend it to you. We love these ready to, to make meal kits, especially when we're, we're on the go with our kids. So one more time, that's factormeals.com slash hags50 to get 50% off your first box. You won't be sorry if you go to factor meals, it gets the hags thumbs up seal of approval. Let's quickly, uh, before we break up here, uh, I just want to go through all the awards, uh, quickly and, and get your thoughts on who you think might be uh, the lead candidate or who you think your lead candidate is. Um, Hart Trophy, I, I've got uh, Nathan McKinnon, uh, dominant player. Colorado's been one of the better teams in the West all year. Um, when you look at shots, he leads the league in shots on net uh, by a wide margin, even over Pasternak. Um, you know, he, obviously he's one of those guys that's like, you know, he, McDavid, there's a few guys that Makar that look like they should be playing in a different league at times uh, with the speed and the skill that they have. But uh, I would go with McKinnon over uh, Kucherov. And I think there was one other, uh, McDavid was the other one who's decided he wants 100 assists this year, uh, clearly. 
So he's uh, racking up the uh, the assists instead of the goals. Uh, Dupes, Hart Trophy. What do you think? I think you're right. I think it is McKinnon. Uh, it, it you know, if you had to pick between McKinnon and McDavid, boy, man. Uh, the, the only the only reason I would tip it toward McDavid winning again is that they had the horrid start. Uh, they make the coaching change, so they make this great recovery that Colorado didn't have to make. So, yep. You know, I, I, is is that a is that a fair assessment of the award? I don't know, uh, but they're two magnificent players. You can make a case for those. I I, I know Kucherov is in the discussion, but he's he's not at their level in my in my mind. And maybe uh, he turned off some people with his uh, skills performance at the at NHL All Star Weekend when he kind of mailed it in. Maybe. <laughs> that was legendary. I don't think that was very becoming of a Hart Trophy winner to to do something like that. Uh, who who do you think for Hart, Mick? Well, first off, from a philosophical angle, it annoys the crap out of me that wingers win the Hart so often and defensemen never do. Yeah, because to me, a defenseman in any in almost any incident instance, a number one defenseman is more important to a hockey team's fortunes than any winger that they have. You better be Cam Neely, you better be Gordy Howe, you better be somebody like that in order to get me to make that kind of consideration. So uh, Kucherov, brilliant, brilliant player, uh, joy to watch play. He's so good in so many ways, uh, but he, I was not on my radar for this ward. Uh, yeah. He may win the Art Ross and let him have it, but good. You know, so uh, I'm with you guys on McKinnon and McDavid. I feel like they're deserving, but I also want to go outside the box a little bit and talk about two Vancouver guys, uh, JT Miller. Uh, I feel like Vancouver is just another skilled team that wouldn't live up to, wouldn't have this impactful and change the season if it wasn't for a player like that. I feel like he's a guy who sort of has injected some old school uh, rock'em, sock'em hockey into a team that is suddenly relevant. And I also look at their young defenseman, Quinn Hughes, who yeah. is my favorite among the Hughes, because if you can play on a team that plays like them and be plus 39, which is might be the best plus minus in the league. And you're taking all the D and you're, this is your style of the game. You're there, Bobby, you for lack of a better uh, description and say, okay, this is, you're like Eric Carlson, except you don't get scored on. I mean, what's wrong with this picture? I mean, this guy's really good. And, uh, and so I, I think that guys like that need to get some consideration here. And I, I, so I tend to think centers, I tend to think defensemen, a yeah. winger better be generational and having a year to, that nobody would ever forget for me to consider it as far as what the circumstances were. So I'm, I'm with you guys on the McDavid McKinnon. It's hard for me. I love Dupes uh, comment about McDavid this year, considering they had to go uh, and, and grab Knobloch out of Hartford to save their season and, and them morphing their team into a team that can do like Edmonton did back in the early eighties and change over from the team that has to win eight to six to the team that can win one, nothing. Uh, and, and I think that McDavid not, you know, still being their leader, still being at the top of the scoring race, still being all those things and re, you know, and reinventing himself, however he has to, in that yeah. regard, I would put him ahead of McKinnon, even though I'm a huge McKinnon fan. Yeah, it's interesting. Like it, it, what you're mentioning about centers and wingers, that was kind of the final determination for me going McKinnon over Kucherov was like, I, I it, the winger better be just that much better than a center who is more impactful. Um, you know, if you're going to give the the most valuable uh, player award to him. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the Canucks. I think JT Miller may get some Selkie consideration, to be honest with you, because of the season he's had. He's been really good on faceoffs. He's been a good all-around player. He's been an impact player for them. I do hope that he gets some kind of awards consideration uh, because he's been an extremely good player for them. Quinn Hughes, uh, we'll go Norris next because he's obviously a candidate there. Uh, I went with Kale McCarr for this as the biggest reason because I looked at Kale McCarr, Quinn Hughes, and Roman Yossi, similar offensive numbers, similar seasons from a production standpoint. You know, they're all very good offensive defensemen. But the one difference between them, Kale McCarr averages about two and a half minutes of penalty kill time a game. Both Hughes and Yossi are around 30 seconds of PK time a game. They basically don't play on the penalty kill. 
Whereas McCarr is a full out penalty kill defenseman for the Colorado Avalanche. And I have a hard time voting for anybody for Norris Trophy that isn't a penalty killer in a, you know, as part of the defenseman description. Just going back to the, I want traditional defensemen in, in, in name and the way they play to win the award rather than glorified offensive defenseman, even though I know that's the direction uh, the league is going in. For, so for that reason, I would go with Kale McCarr. Uh, Mick? I think I think historically Yossi is an all-purpose, the, the closest thing to Ray Bork that we've seen in the league in a long time. And I think he has been the best defenseman on average in the NHL for probably, I don't know, what, a decade maybe? But, um, but yeah, in regards to them dialing him back and not having him play in that role so that they could use him to generate a challenged offense. That's, that's what happens when you, when, when you, uh, then you do lose out you know, on, on, when it comes to awards, because you're not doing that, that all purpose thing anymore. And, and you know what, and maybe that serves the Nashville Predators uh, purposes more because they're a team that needs Yossi more to help their attack and yeah. so he has to pour more of those 24 plus, you know, minute nights uh, into that. And, you know, and so I think it's in him. I think it's always been there and they're just doing it different now with him. And I won't, and I'd say that, yeah, those are the ramifications. If you're not doing that role, then, then, then you shouldn't be in that situation uh, in award time. I agree with you. Yeah, I do think, though, Yossi, I think you're right, Mick. I think Yossi's going to get a lot of consideration, like it's his time to win this award this year. You know, the, this is a groundswell of support, I think, for him because he's had such a great body of work. Um, Dupes, what do you think for Norris? I'm in the groundswell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I love him as a player. Uh, they went out and got Luke Shen to kind of take some of the hitting, you know, the targeting, I should say, uh, away from him. Yep. Uh, uh, and he's 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 a, he's a smart, splendid player. This this ties into a part of the discussion we had earlier. Ray Bork should have should have won a heart along the way. Absolutely, right? eighty nine ninety, closest yeah. vote ever went to Messier because he did it without Gretzky. But they didn't knock the season out of the park. They won the cup. It's a regular season award. The Bruins finished first overall. Yeah, and and part and parcel of the discussion being. You know, Ray can get the Norris. So right. I hate that. I hate that logic. That 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 is just not acceptable to me. It's a it's a it's a the heart is a trophy that should be awarded based on itself. Right. And he could have been a he, Ray Bork was a candidate for that at least two or three times. Absolutely, a legitimate Absolutely. candidate. Yeah. But yep. back to back to back to two thousand and twenty four. <laughs> uh, I, I would say yeah, Yossi. Uh, and again, part part of, part of the, my thinking there is what they had to do. They 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 had dotted along around 500 up until the 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 U two event, if you will, or non event. Uh, they got it going, and he's been a tremendous player for them. But yeah, that said, the other two guys are great. You know, great, not just players, but they're you know they they there are so few players who can, can really command spotlight out there. They do. McCall. My car is so quick. It's amazing how quick he moves from any position. It could be standing still and he only needs to go eight feet. It, it'd be me lateral, whatever. Reminds me a little bit of Brian Leach in that regard. Did he say that the quickness is uh, just off the charts? Um, you know, but uh, it's, but boy, oh boy. And, and you know what? I love watching him in the playoffs because to me, that's the true test of a defenseman whose game is a uh, legacy of his game is on the offensive side of the puck. Playoffs show how good he is. Marcar's won the Stanley Cup. He was a huge piece of it. So to me, when a guy, you know, is able to do that, it elevates that defenseman in my mind. Yeah. He's that no guy. question. Yeah. And and it, you know, it like I said before, like I was looking for some differentiating thing between the three of them because the numbers were so similar. And when you start to break it down, they all had excellent seasons in their own right. So you're looking for, you know, something that differentiates one from the other two. Um Calder Trophy. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people just preordained this for Connor Bedard this year. Um, the injury definitely played in where he missed some time. When you look at his season, it was good, not great. Um, you know, obviously not playing on a very good Blackhawks team. I ended up going with Brock Faber uh, in Minnesota just because he's been so good 
uh, for the wild as a defenseman, um, you know, playing huge minutes, uh, playing really impactful hockey, good all around defenseman. Um, and I think this is one of those instances where maybe you shine the light on a, a good two way defenseman uh, instead of on the, you know, the shiny object that everybody's trying to prop up uh, in the league as the new face of the league. And rightfully so, I'm sure he will be a few years from now. Uh, but Dupes, Calder, what do you think? I'd size it up just the way you have there. I, Faber's done a terrific job. Uh, I, I still think the, it, it'll be the eye candy that yeah. will take it for Bedard. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and again, he's he's, he, he's an exciting, fun player, whereas Faber's done a, a solid job. It's it's not as it's, uh, you know, the Wild have been better since they made the coaching change. Um Faber is definitely meat and potatoes, though. There's no question about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's that's the best way to characterize it. 25 so. minutes a game. Yes. That's incredible. Oh, yeah. Are there any goalies in this discussion we should be thinking about? I'm trying to isolate them when I look at the uh, stats page, and I'm I'm having trouble finding my way there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't remember there being a goalie that uh, that deserved consideration as, as high as Faber and, and Bedard. There may be one that ends up in the top five. All right, I finally, finally figured it out here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I think it comes down to Faber or Bedard um, as the the final two uh, choice. And I think you know, Mick, it may end up being Bedard just because, you know, that's that's kind of what the you know everybody has wanted since uh, day one when he came into the league and was drafted number one overall. I'd be disappointed in my my uh, my writer colleagues who have still have votes. Um, we know they revamped things and pared down the number of votes um, in Boston. Um, I haven't had one for a few years here, five years, I think. But, uh, and that's not a complaint. Sometimes I'm glad now that I don't. <laughs> because, uh, but uh, you know what? Um, Kotchikov is probably the best of the goal at Carolina. Um, yeah. And he's, you know, plays for a very strong defensive team, 238, 911. Um, that's not a through the roof save percentage. Uh, and and Urson's the only guy with a lower goals uh, goals against. No, no, it, that's not a lower goals against. They're doing it on a different basis here. I'm mean, never figured out what it is, but it doesn't matter. Urson's really struggled anyway recently. So yeah, is there a guy here? There's no goalie here that, that challenges Faber, in my opinion. No, um, I, I think I'm I think I'm with you on the Faber. Fabulous Faber. Yes. Uh, very Charlie McAvoy esque from people that have watched him in Minnesota. He plays a, a similar style game. Um, Vesna Trophy, uh, Connor Hellebuck, Thatcher Demko. I feel like it comes down to the two of them. Uh, it may uh, maybe a toss up between the two. This is one I, where I went with Hellebuck just because I think he's been so important to Winnipeg being a playoff team in the style that they play. Uh, low scoring defensive team all year. Uh, maybe not going to work out for them come playoff time, but. Uh, I think he's been huge for them. Uh, Mick Vesna, what do you think? Uh, I think Hella Busick is going to win. Yeah. Um, and I don't begrudge him that. I think, you know, the stats aren't there right now when I look at season long stats, but I got to say, in games I've watched, the guy who really kind of won me over that is really a good goalie that I haven't really given my own personal credit to over the years is Ottinger. I, I really, yeah. really believe that Dallas has a goalie there, even yep. though the numbers don't. Aren't, aren't uh and you know what hey uh Stuart skinner if that save percentage wasn't down at 906 if he was in the teens he might get some love for this because he's also a player an internal solution on a team that couldn't stop talking about its goaltending yeah. as being the bane of its existence for the last decade or so well that uh, was the he, big uh rumor in season is that Elmark was going to get shipped out to edmonton because they needed a goalie right that's what right, everybody precisely uh, wanted yeah. to see happening yeah yeah. So it's funny, you know, if you look at the goalies who have posted wins in the NHL stats, uh, Georgiev is the only, uh, Georgiev uh, is 37, Demko 34, yeah. and Skinner 30, Skinner and Bob at 33. Hellebuck is all the way down at 32. He's usually like right up there, right? So he's only five behind the leader, and he's got a two point, what has he got? He, uh, a 2.43 and a 919 and that's the best save percentage amongst the wins leaders you got to go yeah. way down to find a save percentage that's higher than that it hasn't been a great year for for save percentage for goaltenders i i think because the bruins run a tandem um 
you know, there was on a, an intermission last night, Hank Lundquist was asked to give his his uh, his ranking of the playoff eight in the East, how he would rank their goaltending. And he deferred to Shesterk and out of, I think, out of in my opinion, out of loyalty to the Rangers. Yeah. And then secondly, he had the uh, the Bruins tandem as his, his. So I think in his opinion, secretly, the Bruins have the best goaltending in the league. So, uh, you know, I mean, if, if this was the Vezina Trophy from from 1972 when Jockerman and Villamure uh, shared it, then I think that there'd be a shared Vezina for the Bruins goalies. But it it became an individual award. Dupes Vezina, what do you think? Um, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to see uh, Skinner's uh, numbers post the change. Uh, in, in, you know, because I, I, I'm sure those numbers would rival anybody, but ultimately, Joe, it's got to be Hellebuck by a landslide over Demko for one reason. Demko went to Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> it was wasn't it wasn't the Demko that uh, dissed Jeremy Swayman with the with the goalie hug too at the All Star weekend? No, like, yeah. it Just wasn't him. Bad, was it? bad, aloof BC guy. Yeah, you can't, exactly. can't give him uh, yeah. to be redundant to be redundant. Was it Demko? <laughs> I'm having there fun. Give folks, it to be you guy. I'm having fun. That's all it is. That's you, all it you is. You got to give it to the blue collar, hard nosed yeah. UMass Lowell guy, dupes. That's yeah, that's what yeah, I think is going to happen here. You know, you always got to defer to the UMass Lowell, the hard working UMass Lowell guy, over gotcha, the BC yeah. guy. No, it no question Demko. about it. Yeah. Um, Selkie dupes. I went with Joel Erickson Eck. I think there's a bunch of good candidates. JT Miller, I mentioned before, I think we'll get consideration. There's some of the usual suspects, Anzi Kopitar, others, Barkov. Uh, anybody that stands out to you? It's the award where I end up getting five guys and, and you, you can throw a dart on it, right? Yep. Uh, you know, um, it's sadly li- missing Patrice Bergeron from the field, where yeah, it was easier yeah, to yeah. pick him out. Yeah. I and and you know, I don't see a lot of Kopitar, but every time I see him, I love him in that yep. definition of of the award. So I'll you know today I'll go with Kopitar. We'll do a podcast a week from now. I can pick another guy. <laughs> Mick, I'm wondering if Reinhardt's going to get any love because he's got five shorties to go with his 50 goal season. Um, Answer no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Barkov's going to get the Selkie votes from uh, for Florida if anybody's voting for anybody down there. Even though Reinhardt's had an unbelievable season, I mean he he certainly should merit heart consideration as well uh, with the season that he's had uh, for Florida. No question about it. Well, he's really been the he's been the constant of that team amongst a bunch of up and down that has somehow managed to tie together that team well enough for it to have the season that it's had. And until yep. this last little swoon, they were in the driver's seat for the president's trophy. So, uh, yeah, it's been quite a quite a season for him. So, uh, you know, sometimes you wonder if the if the writers are just going to go with a with a um, uh, one, one of those uh, sentimental favorites. Somebody who's always been in a hunt has been waiting for Bergeron to retire so they could win the thing. And mm. this might be the year they get that vote. So it could be a little weird. Yeah, I agree. Um... I think there's a couple of clear cut ones for the last one here. Jack Adams, um, uh, Torts, I think we'll get plenty of consideration. I loved what he had to say the other day um, just about, you know, players tuning him out or, you know, it, 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 it sort of like you got the wrong coach, you got the wrong players that, uh, you know, uh, sort of a uh, long monologue he went on when he was asked about, you know, the players getting the message, all that stuff. I think he's done a great job with the Flyers. Um, aside from maybe criticizing their goalie who was going through a rough time. And then he backtracked on that to his credit. Uh, but Rick Tockett, I think has done a great job with the Canucks. Uh, they were not a playoff team last year. Um, turned them around. They are going to go now. Are they going to do anything in the playoffs? I don't know. I don't know if they're built for the playoffs, but, uh, certainly they've had a great regular season. So I would go with Tockett for that and, and the job he's done there. The broadcasters make this vote and, uh, I think that that Knobloch also needs to get some consideration here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Another in-season change that that uh, you know Talkett obviously has turned the 
Canucks into a team that has uh, really had a brilliant regular season that, that was looking really bad start off the hop. Um, so you look at those, um, but yeah, my heart's with torts, but I don't think he'll get it. I think it'll be probably talk it. Dupes, what do you think? Talk it because it is a broadcast award, but to me, it's Knobloch. <laughs> not, I was looking at these percentages yesterday. Knobloch, as of yesterday, I think they lost last night. I'm not sure, guys. They uh, did. Okay, so take this percentage as wrong. But as of yesterday, he was 42, 14, and 4. That's 733. Wow. That's, that's a better percentage than anybody in the league, right? Uh, Patrick Waugh, of course, his impact in the island is they've performed – less than they did under Lane Lambert. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that that those I don't those effects won't be realized till next season if they're going to be good. <laughs> too much going right. on there. Right. Way too much. So hey, and you know something, here's the other thing. Just same way I believed about Peter Laviolette when the Providence Bruins went from worst to first in 99 and won the Calder uh cup. Uh, and set a record for wins in the AHL. He won the coach of the year. It's the only coach of the year he's ever won. Uh, he was deserving of consideration when he took over the Flyers right before the 2010 Winter Classic at Fenway Park and got them into the playoffs on the last day of the season and all the way to game six of the Stanley Cup. Um, you know, so an off the mat against the Bruins, obviously, in that infamous series. So uh, guys like that don't necessarily, you got to have like a, some something has to special has to happen in order for a, a job like that to, uh, you know, and I think about the next season with the Pete Bruins, when the flu went through their team and the same basic group of players almost didn't even make the playoffs. He got them in and they were one overtime goal away from winning the call the cup again, because whoever won that series against Hartford game seven overtime was going to just absolutely roll the uh, I think Rochester, but any case um, guys are always, these wards always tend to go to guys who achieve superlatives. So uh, that's another reason why I think talk it because of Vancouver's season, he'll get that love. Uh, but if the flyers are in the playoffs, then to me, if they, if they keep it, if they somehow get a playoff spot here to, in my brain, I'll always remember this as torts year. I agree. And, uh, I, you know, great coach, uh, great on the off days sometimes when he, you know, is a little more effusive with what he has to say rather than like right after a game or uh, the morning skate of a game when he, you know, is clipped and doesn't want to answer questions. But I think the league is a better, more interesting place for, you know, coaches like Torts being there that uh, they bring some personality and some fire into it. Um, dupes, uh, Mick, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let's also thank prize picks, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks, you simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. Um, March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April, be a part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. You can win now up to a hundred times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand with basketball, college basketball, and hockey entries today on prize picks America's number one fantasy sports app. Uh, download this prize picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. That's download the prize picks app, app today. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Kevin Paul DuPont, Mick Collagio. Thank you very much, boys. Pleasure. Thank you everybody for listening. We'll see you at the rink.